On today's episode, I meet with Daniel Maté, who co-authored the book with his father, Gabor, titled The Myth of Normal. Welcome to the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast, where we explore life through the lens of somatics. I'm Luis Mojica, a somatic educator who teaches people how to find safety in themselves. Your turn to learn begins now. Okay, Daniel, so thank you so much for being here and taking your time to speak with me about this incredible book. Oh, thank uh, you. My pleasure. And thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because so the last few years I've had this desire to write a book and I haven't had the capacity. And I kept saying to myself, the book I want to write is going to come out. And this is the book that I wanted to write. And <laughs> so now I don't have to you write should, my books. You okay. should sue us. You should sue us for IP copyright infringement. No, no. It's like, I'm just so blown away by this book. It's, it's like it came from the depths of, I don't know, some experience that I've been waiting some, for someone to write about. Yeah. You know, and I, I guess my first question is, how did, it, how did it emerge that you and your father would co-author this? Like, tell me about that process. Yeah, well, it was in some ways by necessity from the vantage point of the project itself, because um, my dad had been trying to write it for 10 years. I mean, I think if, if anyone who's followed my dad's work and then reads this book will get the sense this is the book he was always meant to write. It brings together everything he's ever written about, including um, the political social angle that's always been a part of his worldview. Um, you know, when I grew up as a kid, he was very politically involved, kind of an outspoken critic of various aspects of our society's normality and the way it treats um, different groups and really the way it treats all of us and the way it it, uh, it fails to account for our needs. And um, so he had this vision for a long time. And after Hungry Ghosts, uh, his previous book about addiction, I think it was, he felt it was time for him to to write what I think was going to become his magnum opus. But the thing is, he didn't know where to start, and it felt too big for him. And um, so he kind of, you know, was Sisyphus for a few years, pushing the boulder uphill and having it roll back on him a lot. He had a book contract um you know, in Canada, his books have always sold very well. So there was a Canadian, his, his Canadian publisher was only too happy to give him a pretty good advance. And, you know, they were excited about it. And he ended up sending that advance back because he was just like, I can't do this. Um, you know, it's interesting when someone has imposter syndrome uh, about trying to be themselves you know it's like i can't live up to this this full expression of my of my view it's just too big it's too much for me and i i was seeing him you know struggle against uh, his own expectations of himself much more than anything else for a long time and then um i mean an another part of the issue with uh i think the way he was approaching the book is he wasn't inspired particularly by the concept of the book he had, it was originally called toxic culture, how capitalism makes us sick, which is a rather narrowed version of what it ended up being and a, and a rather negative one. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, it has the diagnostic angle, but it doesn't mention healing at all, which ended up being a very important piece. And if you're gonna talk about where society gets things wrong, um, not that you have to pre present a, a rosy, hopeful, Pollyanna-ish view, which is not his wheelhouse, but you do, I think it is incumbent. I think he always wanted to offer something in the realm of, well, what does healing look like? And over the years, he's actually developed a, an educational course on a healing approach called Compassion and Inquiry. So this seemed like an opportunity to put that in writing and, and share yeah. it with, with everybody so that even as you're... Um, reckoning with the bad news of how it is which of course is actually part and parcel of any genuine healing process you have to look reality in the face you know some principles and guidelines for for moving towards wholeness had to be in there and that also was daunting to him because he's like well do i really have anything to say can i teach this can i put it in writing all of which brought us to about four and a half years ago when he was finally writing a book proposal for this new concept, The Myth of Normal. Um, and he shared it with me. I've been his editor in the past. I helped him edit 
in the realm of hungry ghosts. I've edited articles of his. He always runs his writing by me. And that has been more stylistic in the past. Um, you know, just livening up the prose, things like that. Um, but I read this book proposal and I got, I had two reactions. One, I was very excited by the concept. Mm -hmm. And two, I was um, struck by how far it had to go in order to um, fulfill its potential. And I guess, yeah, the third feeling was a sense of purpose. Like this really should fulfill its potential. Like I want to see this, like I'm on side with this and it would be disappointing if he either um, succumbed to his, his insecurities about it, or if it ended up being anywhere less than what it could be. And so I, some, something in me got up the gumption to say to him, dad, I want to help you with this. And in fact, I think you need my help on this mm. and I'd need to be something more than your editor this time. I got to come out from behind the curtain. And to my delight, he said, I was hoping you would say that. So at that point, I jumped aboard and I said, well, I'm going to take this book proposal. I'm going to completely rework it. And so I restructured it. You know, I'm a musical theater writer. I'm a storyteller, a musician. I'm a lyricist. So, you know, style, flow, arc, character, and um, engagement is, is just an instinct I have. And so I, I just tried to rework the book proposal from the perspective of if I was someone who was coming into this cold, mm -hmm. that is not already aboard the trauma train, like not in the world of healing and all this kind of stuff, maybe I've never done therapy. Maybe I'm just someone who's living in the society and I'm watching things go the direction they're going. And I've noticed some things. I've noticed some glitches in the matrix, but I don't have a framework for explaining it all or understanding it. Would this draw me in. And so that was the, mm. that was my heuristic as I worked on it. And then we worked on it together and we got it to the point where we were both delighted with it, sent it into the publishers and, or to our agent. And then we had a bidding war all of a sudden, like different publishers wanted to publish it. So that's when we knew we were onto a good thing. And already my presence was helping him feel more solid about it. So from there, we had to work out the kinks of how do we write together? How does he share his voice? How does he allow me to influence the tone of it? And also, how do I make my voice heard without trying to swamp or dominate his voice, which has to be at least the first person pronoun of the book? It's, you know, he's the I and the me and the myself in the book. So how do I lend my skill set and my sensibility to this project and still allow him to be front and center and his ideas to be front and center? Um, and it, so that's how it all came about. And I um, mean, that's pretty amazing yeah. uh, for many reasons, because I, I love what you said about your intention being someone that's coming into this without knowledge of trauma healing. Um, I'm a trauma therapist. I've never read any of your dad's books until this one. Okay. He's always been in my periphery and I saw the documentary a few years ago and that was like gorgeous, but I, yeah. I didn't know any of his writings. So this was my first, you know, Mate read. And I think what I loved about it was that I can feel this relationship in it that mm. must have emerged from your relationship of writing it. It feels soothing and it feels warm and it feels relational. Mm. It didn't feel clinical. It didn't feel hopeless. It didn't feel negative. It felt like so balanced. And I think that's what I love about it is it really feels like through conversation and relationship, these things emerged. Yeah. And so when you're telling me about this process, I think it, you're, I see you as like to use somatic terms, a co-regulator, you know, mm -hmm. with your father through this yeah. process and in life, I'm sure you two have a bond. So as a co-regulator, you gave space for something different to come through that might have been really hardened or heavy if it was just him by himself. I think that's right. Now I, you know, I should say he's written four books previously and they're all beautifully written his voice on his own is not lacking. Um, when it comes to his subspecialty areas, at least, um, I did help him with In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, the one on addiction. Um, but, you know, he wrote about attention deficit disorder in scattered minds. He wrote about uh, the connection between suppressed emotions and, and um, health problems and when the body says no. And, you know, he's had really good editors, but he's written on his own. 
it was just the scope of this. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's one thing to sort of be an expert on this topic or on that topic. It's another one to step out into the world and say, hey, everybody, I'm looking at what you're looking at. And here's what I'm seeing. And this, the stakes are high for all of it. It was a much more vulnerable mm. um, and ambitious thing. And, and, and quite frankly, you know, with a major U.S. publisher behind him for the very first time who was slated to do actual publicity, get him on, you know, some of the world's biggest podcasts. None of this had ever happened before. He was a word of mouth kind of cult figure. I don't mean, I don't mean cult figure mm -hmm. as in like a cult leader, but you know what I'm saying in terms <laughs> of a following yeah. in, Ca in Canada, he had always been a bestseller, but, but here in the States, <clears throat> not so much. So that came with a certain level of pressure and anxiety. So what you're saying about co-regulating co-regulation is I think very apt. And I noticed that of course that was tricky for me because part of my traumatic imprint was that my parents couldn't regulate themselves and that my big brain and my, um, what's the word, sort of supercharged personality was recruited and commandeered to try to regulate the totally chaotic atmosphere of our home at great detriment to me. Mm -hmm. I developed superpowers and every superhero has a tragic origin story, right? Something has to overcompensate to cover up or to... Um, balance out a deep wound. So, but then I'd have to remind myself, okay, in this case, I'm getting paid to help <laughs> regulate my father and I'm getting paid yeah. quite well to help <laughs> regulate my father. And in a sense, that scaffolding of a professional collegial collaboration was really necessary for me. It was really healthy. It's like, Hey, actually the world is saying, yeah, I mean, the term emotional labor is a little overused and overwrought sometimes, right? It can be pulled out. I, I don't want to disparage it, but, you know, we hear it a lot. It, it, it's Maybe it's lost some of its oomph, but quite literally, this is emotional labor that as a child, uh, I was uh, almost indentured to, or, or at least recruited into, and um, and it felt like back pay in a way. And oh, but, so, but also, but for a very forward-looking, positive purpose, it wasn't. Yes, it wasn't. Yes. Repar it wasn't reparations. It was repair, and it yes. was. It was for something that wasn't about us. So it, it it gave me a sense of, and also a sense of boundaries, because there are limitations to how much I can co-regulate a collaborator. I write musicals. Mm. I'm usually the one who needs to be regulated by my collaborators, and they are very most of them. Like I'm the anxious one. I'm the neurotic one. I'm the one who over identifies with the work. I'm the one who has fantasies of it doing this and that and anxieties that it won't. And so I've seen mm -hmm. my collaborators smartly know how much is enough to hold my hand and how much is like, okay, Daniel, you have to sort this out on your own. And I did at a certain point have to say to my dad, dad, you're gonna have to get a therapist. Mm -hmm. I cannot, this is no longer about the work. This is about an old dynamic between us where you, your, the overflow of your angst is, is just more than I can take on, even in a professional context. So all of that, what I'm saying is it was scaffolding training wheels for setting boundaries and, and developing muscles in myself that had always been very difficult to do outside the context of a working relationship. I mean, I had that on my list, you know, to talk to you about because your father's been vocal, right, about uh, his temper and how he was as a father. And you two do this work together publicly now around repair. I think you even have a book together that you are not, releasing? Or? Not yet. It's not the yet. next one we have to write once the publicity for this last one dies down. Got we it. already lead, we lead a workshop on the topic of adult-child parent relationships. So that's called Hello Again, a fresh start for parents and their adult children. We do the workshop. We, we're doing two this fall. We'll be doing some more next year. There's a book coming. There's a podcast coming. Yeah. Well, I think what I find amazing about that is what you just said, because I was going to ask you, what was it like as a son with this traumatic imprint from your father, you having to be the one to regulate your parents, and here you are in this, what could be a trauma reenactment, but you're saying, I like the word training wheels and scaffolding. It was this kind of renegotiation where you got to use this thing you developed in a way that worked for you, had boundaries, had a purpose, and there was a different identity around it, I'm hearing. Well, absolutely. And it's all context, isn't it? It's not so much about 
I mean, mm-hmm. it's all context. The, the original context was I was a small child. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I was a very unsophisticated child who had to pretend to be more sophisticated than he was. I was a child who needed, came into the world non-negotiably needing security, stability, some kind of ontological coherence. You know, I had to come into the world. I, I didn't know anything. Mm-hmm. And nature would have had you know, if, if, if we weren't living in a world where a father has to barely survive the Holocaust and a mother has a traumatic imprint from her own childhood and they have a chaotic relationship, well, you know, nature would have wanted me to grow up in a big village with lots of elders and community members who could have held them and helped them hold me. And then I would have had a stable sense of what the world was. Well, that wasn't what was for dinner. That just wasn't what was served up to me when I was born. And You don't get to choose. The menu is not, doesn't come with options. So in other words, I had to adapt to a particular situation and humans are very adaptable, but when we're young, we adapt at a cost. If Mm -hmm. we're adapting to the absence, um, the non-satisfaction of our needs or even the frustration of them. So that's one context. And in that context, that's going to leave a, a traumatic imprint, right? Disconnections from myself or within Mm -hmm. myself, over-exaggerations or distortions of certain natural strengths I have, and ultimately a trail of um, grief, sadness, anger, resentment, confusion, and even, you know, mental distress that I've, that's manifested uh, throughout my adult life. That's one context. So that's traumatic. That's one of those small T traumas that ought not to have happened. If, again, all else being equal, if, if, if nature, if we were living in a perfect world, which we're not. The current context is very different. I'm a grown up whose talents are developed with some professional, you know, um, acumen and success under my belt as a writer. Um, my dad is much older. He's no longer responsible for my upbringing. I've done a lot of work on my own healing. I'm now responsible for my own emotional regulation. And to the extent that I stay locked in a dynamic where my father has to constantly atone and make amends for, and even make reparations for things he failed to provide me in the past due to his own limitations, I'm ripping myself off. That's no longer healthy for me. That's not authentic. Mm -hmm. It's just never going to happen. He cannot ever make up that debt. And so ultimately healing has to be about debt forgiveness, if not total emotional forgiveness. I mean, that Mm -hmm. comes when it comes, but I got to just acknowledge that's not going to be paid back Mm -hmm. from them, from, you know, maybe as Bjork said, maybe not from the directions you've poured yours, maybe not from the sources you are staring at. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And uh, I I like to quote lyrics a lot because I'm a lyricist. They just come to me. So, uh, In other words, in this new context, maybe there's an opportunity in being in a role where it's going to remind me of some of the details, the, the, the facts on the ground of my childhood. And yet I can constantly remind myself up, update my operating system that, oh, now is not then. This is not that the war is over and any deficiencies I have, any difficulties I have, well, it's cross training and it's full on. I mean, look, everybody in the world, as long as we're, as long as a person's carrying traumatic imprints, everybody's going to remind them of their early childhood, their boss, their spouse, even their kids. Well, I had this opportunity to like go right to the the source. I'm being, I'm being reminded of my dad by my dad, except it's a new version of him. So what you're talking about here is what I'm, I teach a lot about over couplings, right? So I want everyone that's listening to this, Daniel is beautifully exemplifying how to uncouple, which is, you know, when you literally are separating the difference between this situation then and this situation now, and you feel it in your body and there is this update that occurs. Yes. And I think it just, to me, lends more of a background understanding of why this book is so impactful Mm. and why it's so easy for me in particular to, and I mean, so many people, but speaking for myself, for me to absorb like bodily, uh, I've read so many trauma books and 
I usually dissociate <laughs> like halfway through them because I, I don't feel uh, like a human is talking to me. Right. It feels like a machine because right. a lot of these people are really brilliant um, and they're speaking to their colleagues. But I love how you know you're saying about one, this intention to speak to the common person who's never done trauma work. And it's being born out of this co-regulated environment where you're actually healing some of your trauma imprints by doing this with your father. I mean, that has to bleed into the energy of the work. Oh, 100%. So, and, right? and, and, and there's there's also delight in it for both of us because those yeah. moments where you do uncouple, I, I call it getting the memo in my uh, yeah. mental chiropractic work with people, which we can talk about if you want. But um, I call that just getting the memo, the, the body, the nervous system, the mind, the identity, the ego. Everyone wakes up and is like, ooh. Mm-hmm. Like, well, mm-hmm. the, That's right. Oh, wow. Okay, whoa, where am I? I was doing the time warp again. Um, it's that so happened. funny. I always call it a, a somatic time warp. I love that you said that. Yeah, yeah. It's just a step to the left and then a jump to the right, right? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. right. Well, and, it well, is, I, and it is a horror picture show. Um, it's a total horror show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so there were many moments during it where one minute we'd be in, you know, sort of ensnared in, in our old dynamic. And then all of a mm-hmm. sudden... Um, realize hey look at us we're we're doing this in real time and, and from you know there's this there's you know there's sometimes there's like spiritual platitudes that you know other people's validation doesn't shouldn't matter like it's what's in like you need to validate yourself no i'm not gonna lie and pretend and say that having my father say to me throughout this daniel i could not do this without you or like mm-hmm. wow you're a good writer and this is like this this chapter is taking off because of or like wow you really helped me see what i w- what was inauthentic and the way i was saying that i'm not going to pretend that doesn't mm-hmm. send a message back in time to young me and say hey hang in there like now that doesn't have to happen you don't want to hold out for that because it isn't always forthcoming to be honest um, what you just said is the gold to me because I, I'm one of those people that believes in self-validation, not in yeah. an isolated way. But what you just said is that to pretend it doesn't feel good is totally bypassing. But yes. to require it for survival or functioning, that's a whole different experience. I think Absolutely. that in-between is so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it means you're you're open to it, you're receptive to it. And the fact is right. that if you're if you're actually open and receptive to it, then getting it from anybody or anywhere in the world is going to is going to deliver that message back mm-hmm. in time as well to say, mm-hmm. okay, what happened back to, because look, and this, I think you're, I, I like what you're saying about that. Something about our, the relational uh, uh, aspect of the writing, the fact that it's the product of um, mm-hmm. a father son process makes it easier to embody. Well, because we're living one of the core teachings, at least one of the core teachings in the book, which is that trauma is not what happens to you. It's what happens inside of you. Mm-hmm. Well, there are things that happen to me and my father has been reciting them to me ever since I, he, ever since I was 11, you know, Daniel, you are the way you are. You're having trouble at school with your friends because you had a stressful birth or because of how we <laughs> treated you when you were two. not helpful, yeah. dad, yeah. not helpful. <laughs> right. And, right. and, and, and to his point, those are the facts of the matter, perhaps, but they don't help me connect with my experience. Okay, so I had a certain experience at age one, two, three, four, five onward. Couldn't have helped, but had that particular experience. Those events, A, are over, and B, if there are new events that are happening that remind me of them, maybe I can have a new experience of them, which both um, produces and stems from, I think, having a new perspective on them. That That's and right. see, and seeing my father as not an all-powerful either deity or tyrant, who were basically the two, the bipolarity of my relationship with him as a kid, but just as a seventy-something-year-old, overworked, very good person who really wants to make a difference in the world and who sometimes gets in his own way and can't always see his son for fully who he is because he's a dad, because that's just how it goes. And, and the fact that, well, my dad should be able to see me because he teaches parents about, no, that's, that's just, that's just, that's, that's childish. Like there is no should. And well, um, see, you're, you're speaking to this part of the, these many parts of the book that always move me and that I really related to the most in terms of philosophy and belief mm. of uh, personality and behavior being expressions of circumstance compared yes. to identity. Yes. 
And I think what's so important about that, that I wanted to ask you from this work and from this real-time consistent uncoupling that you're practicing with your father, if tell us, the listeners, why it's so important to distinguish between personality and behavior as emergence of circumstance compared to identity when it comes to response versus blame. Hmm. That's a big question. I know. So we can take our time with it. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would start by honing in on, you know, the, um, <laughs> the fuckery of identity. I might say. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. I, Let's start I, there. Identity itself is a real can of worms. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're living in a time where identity has become, to say the least, a politicized term with Absolutely. all kinds of people all over the map about it. Um, I think identity is both demonized and venerated in ways that are unhelpful uh, and kind of mystifying uh, in our current discourse. And it means different things at different times to different people. But if you look at, I mean, my dad always breaks down this word etymologically. Identity comes from two Latin words, idem, which means same, and facere, which means to make. So when you identify, you make something the same as something else. You equate, and I would say you conflate, which is to say, if I um, enjoy helping people, well, that's one thing, right? It's an activity. Or I could make an identity out of it. I'm a helper. Yes. Right? So number one, and, and, and you know, if you look at Buddhism, which of which I'm not a practitioner or an expert, but you know, the root of suffering is attachment and not attachment in the healthy developmental sense in which we talk about it in the book, but attachment to concepts. Another word for attachment is identification. Mm -hmm. I am this, I am that. Well, if you, if you speed, if you slow things down, you'll see that you are not all those things. You are a dynamic process. You're not even solid. You're just a bunch of, you know, sizzling isotopes to, to, ch to channel a Steely Dan lyric, um, <laughs> of, of all things. Um, uh, and, um, just molecules, right? So yeah. we, we take certain forms and these forms are compelling. And in certain sense, they have some reality to them. But if we identify with them, say that this is who I am, a, we're limiting ourselves B, when it comes to identifying with certain parts of the personality, it turns out, as we say in the book, that many of those personality traits that we think are who we are, they are outgrowths of particular traumatic wounds where we got disconnected from who we are. And who we are is not an identity. Who we are is a self, mm. which is just much more fluid and capacious than than sort of a story, a narrative in our head, the story of ourselves, the story right. of ourselves as a story. It's cool. I mean, I'm a theater artist. I like telling stories, including stories about myself, but it's the good thing about theater is, you know, it's a story in our lives. We act as if our story is the truth and all of our suffering is contained in the story, not in the facts of the matter. Literally. We don't I want to pause there a minute. Cause yeah, yeah, yeah. for people listening, there's like so much that we're both saying that I want to like, Sorry, yeah. a little bit. No, yeah. don't be sorry at all. I love it. I, I want to start with this piece about personality emerging from traumatic imprints. Sure. Because as a somatic therapist, I'm always bringing people back to their sensations of these personalities and behaviors. Hmm. And so one that comes to mind that is so prevalent in the book is people pleasing. Yeah. And the the trauma response for that, we call it fawning, right? And so there's this reflexive fawn response, which means I acquiesce to you to settle your system so I have safety, you know, in, in the face of threat, if you are my threat, let's say. That's where yes. it emerges from. Yes. So what you're saying is important because when we talk about identity as I freeze myself based on a personality slash behavior, that isn't who I am. It's something that my body is doing. Once we're able to, uh, to use the word, uncouple my identity from my behavior, that's where I also see we simultaneously take blame away from, let's say, um, chronic illness that emerges from 30 years of people pleasing. Mm -hmm. So it goes from that place of, um, you don't have cancer because you did this to yourself. This isn't a punishment. 
cancer is an expression of the biology that's imbalanced from being a people pleaser. Yeah. So tell us like when you're what you learned from this book and your own work, how do you hold that space for someone where you can help them or or you see them point and, and locate the cause of their biology without the shame and the guilt attached to that cause? Yeah, well, I should say that, first of all, I'm not a trauma therapist. I'm not a therapist of any kind whatsoever. I do something that I guess is therapeutic called mental chiropractic, but I made it up. I'm not certified in it. <laughs> That's uh, fine with me. <laughs> you know, um, so in terms of holding space for people to connect dots between their physical symptoms or their physical ailments and afflictions and early tra- trauma, that's not really my bag. Uh, I learned a lot about it from writing the book. Um, so what's your also, insight from, from writing the yeah. book? What would your insight be on that piece of yeah. blame and response being two different things? Well, no, I mean, blame is also a story. Mm. Yeah. Blame, blame is a narrative and blame has an implicit, what I call working theory. That's one of the core principles of one well, of the core sort of modules, I guess, of my mental chiropractic work is inside every stuckness, every stuck point in someone's life, whether it's big and chronic or small and acute, um, um, there is a working theory. There's a like, and it's cognitive. It's a story. It's a narrative and the narrative underneath the narrative subtext of blame is the word shouldn't or shouldn't have rather you know the past yeah that's good the past the past counterfactual tense that yep. and that this should not the the past normative counterfactual tense and that this <laughs> this that, you know in a perfect world this didn't happen in this world it shouldn't have happened yes uh well immediately that entire setup is a setup for suffering because right. there is no world in which this, at least as far as we know, we don't live in a parallel universe. So um, blame comes from uh, an inability or a refusal to be with what is. Probably mm. a, f- a fear that if I am just with what is, it'll overwhelm me. Mm. At least blame gives us an illusion of agency, like I'm against this, like I am anti you know, like I'm like I'm out there on the streets with a placard being like down with reality, like down, <laughs> down with down with yes. my past as it yes. was. I'm against it, meaning I don't condone it. It shouldn't have happened. Well, again, it depends on the context from a developmental point of view, from an optimal parallel universe point of view. Of course, it shouldn't have happened. Should a person have been raped in childhood? No. And we that's we know that because we are compassionate beings with an image of who we could be, mm-hmm. you know, of, of possibility. And in a world of possibility, of course, that wouldn't happen. But it's that's different than saying someone is, there's something wrong here that this, like, like this that's is a, mis- this is a, mis- right. this is a mistake. Because See, that's what's important it is, to me it's right not, there. It's not correctable that it happened. What's correctable is what did you take from it? What wounds did it leave? What assumptions, what beliefs, what distortions, what misperceptions, what prejudices about yourself and about the world did it leave imprinted on you? So I'm going to follow that up with something you and your dad wrote in the book. Um, actually, it was a quote from Eve Ensler. Mm-hmm. Now known as now v. v. I was going to say now known as V. Yeah. The creator of, and writer of the Vagina Monologues. And it's these two paragraphs, and I want to read them fully because it's so beautiful. And it's exactly what you're saying. She writes, a disease is not like a thing. It is an energy flow. It is a current. It is evolution or devolution that occurs when you're not awake and connected and trauma is essentially ruling your life. I think it's such a mistake to identify it as a thing because that makes it hard matter when it's in fact a much more psychological, spiritual, emotional condition. Mm -hmm. And then based on what you were just saying about the against it, this is what I was hearing. She writes, what if when you got sick, you weren't a stage of disease, but in a process and cancer, just like having your heart broken or getting a new job or going to school were a teacher. What if rather than being cast out and defined by some terminal category, you were identified as someone in the middle of a transformation that could deepen your soul, open your heart. That's like when you're saying I'm against this and we're talking about our bodies we're literally at war with ourselves. Well, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and 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 
uh, the amazingly ironic thing about that is that is not a subversion of your trauma. That's a, an amplification of your trauma. Your trauma started with being at war with yourself because you can only become a people pleaser identity. You can only fashion that mask for yourself. If you first repress all the things that would stop you from automatically people pleasing, like say mm -hmm. anger or self-defense or any other natural impulse that any mammal is born with, any animal is born with. So, in other words, you have to, there's a civil war inside of you. And mm -hmm. as, as a child, the, whatever's going to have us maintain the attachment relationship is always going to win. There's no blame in that. It's a strictly survival need, but at the cost of our authenticity. Um, and later we see diseases and afflictions and addictions. Um, I should say so-called diseases because the chapter you're quoting from even interrogates unpacks you could say the very notion of disease as a thing as yes. as 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 v said you know it's a process and so when we say this shouldn't have happened the war on cancer hashtag fuck cancer all this very understandable martial language we're um kind of um we're onboarding the trauma and and hoping that it'll you know we're we're we're, we're not addressing the root dynamic as mm -hmm. opposed to, so, my, you know, my cancer is not who I am. It's not my identity, but it's not separate from who I am either. It's not separate from the life I've lived, let's say. Um, this is another problem with the term survivor. You know, I worry about people who identify too strongly with, with being, you know, a survivor that, you know, destiny's child song is a banger. Let's not, let's, <laughs> let's not, let's not front on that, but, but, you know, and, and the Gloria Gaynor <laughs> song too. Um, uh, there's something to be said for surviving, mm -hmm. but once you've survived, who are you? Right. See, that's, that was the moment for me that changed my life because I went to a therapist and all of these repressed memories of assault had come up. And she said, you are a survivor of childhood sexual assault. And for one year, I wore that like a badge. Mm -hmm. And I, I became insomniatic again. I became filled with anxiety. I became filled with fear. So many things were happening in my biology I hadn't experienced when I was blocking out the, the assaults. And that, that word survivor kept, and this is where the identity conversation is so important to me, it kept somatically creating a time warp where my body and physiology was matching that of the identity. Yeah. And then when I was able to update again, uncouple then from now, there was this feeling of, Oh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm what I, I'm where I am right now. And, yes. and it moved from like, what am I to where am I? Yeah. And it became the sensational experience of moment to moment. That's where I am. That's who I am in that moment. Yeah. But it was this huge liberation. Can I ask you a question? Was, was there, a scaffolding or training wheels function to that term for a while for you? Like being, was there a moment of like when she gave you that, that term, a survivor, just like when someone says, hi, I'm Daniel and I'm an alcoholic, um, which I'm not saying that, but uh, you know, that's what <laughs> I would say if I went to a meeting like that. Um, I mean, I'm certainly a Daniel and I'm a person who's prone to addictive behavior, but that's a different, that's a different chapter. Um, <laughs> there's there, it seems to me that that badge can help people for a while and then it can become its own, um, that the armor gets heavier than, than mobility would, would want. Does that sound right? Was it helpful to you for that's a while? That's where I was lucky. It was that it was a year that it wasn't decades. Yeah. Because that one year having that identity gave me permission to have all this kind of like rage and understand where my addictive behaviors came from and yeah, relationship well, so the, issues. Those kind I of think things. the perfect. So that points that confirms my suspicions that identity does have its positive sides if we wear it loosely and carry mm -hmm. it lightly. Mm -hmm. It gives us some pre made shapes to fit ourselves into that give us. It's like a yoga pose, you know, like it's mm -hmm. like you get into a certain pose and, you, and certain things can flow or whatever. So you, it allows you to see yourself. It, it allows you to, I mean, look, mental health diagnoses are another thing that can become an identity. And there's all kinds of things wrong with the DSM psychiatry model, right? I'll tell you though, one of the most transformative moments in my life was when a therapist here in New York four years ago, shortly after the book contract was signed, actually, and my parents and I had had a big 
explosive thing that landed me in a depression for months. She said to me, have anyone ever suggested to you that you might have a kind of hypomanic tendency? I said, what's that? She said, it's a mild form of bipolar disorder. And something in me just completely released and relaxed because I saw my life through a certain filter that lended it coherence. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I could see that the highs and the lows were part of the same cycle. They were part of the same coping mechanism. Now, what I didn't do was go, I'm bipolar. I never said that. I've never said that. I never joined any group support group for bipolar people. I might have. That might have been useful. I don't know. But it was more just like I took that term, kind of a constellation as a description of something that isn't just unique to me. Mm-hmm. It is something that people tend towards who have had a certain life experience and have a certain temperament. And it allowed me to monitor myself going forward to say, okay, how how much am I falling into that again? Plus, it turns out there was a prescription that matches that diagnosis that's been super helpful for me. And I didn't expect that after years of going on and off SSRIs and finding them worse than unhelpful. This particular one all of a sudden gave me an inner watcher position, like an in between the highs and the lows that I never got from many, many meditation retreats and ayahuasca ceremonies and attempts to be quote unquote mindful. So it just turned on a switch. I don't know how it worked. I don't really care. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is the, again, it was a kind of, it's been a kind of scaffolding for me, a kind of a crutch that I needed actually to stand up and say, oh, okay, now it makes some kind of sense. Now, now that I have that, I'm responsible for no, given that I know that I have that tendency, I don't call it a disability. I don't call it any, even a mental illness. It's a tendency, a proclivity, an orientation towards big highs and big lows. I can see that it's a coping adaptation from my childhood. I write about it in the book. Um, in one little section that's in my voice. And now I can be responsible for it. I can, I can steward it mm. and I can have it just, I can integrate it into a more fluid sense of my identity now. So See, I that's think really important I don't want to be anti, anti-identity either. No, no, I agree. That piece about stewarding it is really important to me because the way I see what we call disease and conditions like COCs, I call them expressions. So I like, yeah, I like tendency, I like expressions because it helps you disidentify with not losing that it's an actual expression, not bypassing it, but not saying it's me. Right. And when we're able to say it's something in me or it's something that expresses through me, that invites the witnesser and the stewarder. Yes. And I think it's so beautiful when you're able to facilitate this expression coming through you and witness it and respond to it. It's the only time you actually have responsibility over this thing. Yes, absolutely. Which I think is just gorgeous. Absolutely. And that answered the question I asked earlier about responsibility and blame. So I think that's amazing. Um, Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm curious, we're almost done here. What, after the, having this whole experience with this book, what have you walked away understanding more about yourself? Mm. What did it bring you to in you that wasn't held or even witnessed before? Yeah. Well, two things I would say. And one ha- one is purely sort of intrapersonal and one is between me and the world. Um the intrapersonal part is that, um, and again, actually, you know what, it's, it's not even just the writing of the book, but it's the publication of the book. So if I go back two months ago, even just prior to the book coming out, um, I was not a happy camper about it. I was not looking forward to it. I had had a really difficult summer. I had had a really significant heartbreak in my life and my musical theater career, which is my, the, been the primary part of my identity, had been very active early in this calendar year. And then it had gone dormant, as often happens. It's a very cyclical, seasonal thing, especially in a time where the, you know, the, the showbiz industry is just still getting back up on its feet after COVID. So I spent much of the summer just kind of languishing and coping and numbing out. And in that light, 
I felt very fragmented. I'm like, oh, great. This big book's going to come out. It's going to get a lot of attention, but my dad's going to get most of the attention. I'm sort of just an appendage to it, or at best, I'm riding his coattails. This is how people are going to see me, or I'm not really into it. I want to be known for my musical theater stuff. Like, I'm getting known for the wrong things. Like, it's the story <laughs> of my life, you know? I'm getting the yeah. wrong kind of attention, damn it. Yep. This was the future I was living into, and it was bumming me the F out. And again, there's a working theory underneath that stuck way of looking at it, it turns out, which is to say that um, all these things are separable and that um, they it's a zero-sum game. One comes at the expense of the other and that there isn't a, a core um, sort of a, 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 a nicely tied knot Mm -hmm. that that holds all, all these different strands mm -hmm. right from which they emanate as the books come out and as my life has started to fill with all kinds of uh, all kinds of projects including musical theaters coming back i've got a show it's going to be done at a at a college in philly in in the spring which i'm now orchestrating for string quartet it's very exciting to be back in that world you know i've got my piano here which i just bought um and the books come out and people like you want to talk to me. And I've been invited to speak in various places. I was in Florida. I've been in Chicago, Toronto. I'm going to Serbia of all places next month. <laughs> and people don't, it turns out, just want to talk to me about what's it like being Gabor Mate's son. They're like, what do you think? Like people want to know what I have to say. And I have to say that it doesn't feel like it's on a different planet from the world mm -hmm. in which mm -hmm. I'm a musical theater composer, lyricist. It doesn't yes. feel like it's on a different planet in which I do these mental chiropractic walks with people, this little you know, business I started. I, there's someone at home, the watcher, the creator, the there's a calling at the center of all of that that, that I'm that I'm present to. And so it infuses everything I do. And I'm no longer all of a sudden so insecure that um, I need to define myself by one identity over the other. And I have a certain, uh, I'm, I'm at the moment, I'm kind of coasting on a river of trust that um, all of these things flow together. Uh, and sometimes they flow apart and sometimes they flow together. That's the the intrapersonal part. Um, well, wait, stay there a minute because I want to Actually, respond. no, that's, bo that's both of them because realizing that me and the world have something to say to each other, the world is interested in me, um, I'm yeah. interested in the world, it's all good. Like it's really... Well, and you and I'm yeah. hearing that security of you being with that part of yourself that's able to express in this way as well. Like that feels there's a self validation there. Yes, and and I guess what I wanted to respond to, not that you need it, but just to kind of like affirm that for you. Um, when you in the beginning of this interview, when you were saying when I was asking about the book, and you were saying you wanted to bring your essentially like the words I'm hearing, like your choreography of musical theater into the flow of this book, <clears throat> I would say that was very impeccably done. Hmm, and part, yeah, and part of your, part of what you are gifting us with of not being Gabor Mate's son, <laughs> but being the co-author, because I actually, there's another identity. Like, <laughs> right, right. Like instead of just being that guy, the son, but this co-author coming through, um, there's this, again, and I really mean this, there's this much more effective relational resonance of how you would describe even your dad's theories, but your own lived experience through yeah. these trauma theories yeah. that are super helpful to all of us. Yeah. Uh, and I, I can't help but say that I, I so parallel your experience because I started as a musician okay. and all I wanted to do was be known for my music. Yeah. And every time I made a record, I went into debt and nothing happened. But then every time I, I opened my private practice, I had a wait list. And I was like, no, I don't want to Stop be it. I don't want to be a successful trauma therapist. <laughs> and so it's only been the last few years I've actually said, oh, I can be an artist as a therapist too. Um, so I just like I I just feel parallel and uh united with you in that way. So thanks for sharing that. Oh, absolutely. It's uh that's good to hear. <laughs> Tell us where we can find you, people that want to look you up after we this. Where, where can sure. You? Well, so you've heard me mention this mental chiropractic thing. Yes. Um, there's a website, uh, walkwithdaniel.com. And the idea of that is I take walks with people, literally. You walk where you are, whether it's Saudi Arabia or Australia or Iceland or Indiana, and I've walked with people in all of those locations, and you're on the phone, and I'm walking where I am, which generally speaking is Brooklyn, although these days, who knows? 
um, and we have a conversation and it's, you bring in a particular thing, your st- particular stuck point. So not a big capital I issue. You know, if you come into me, you say, I've got mommy issues or I've got commitment issues. I'll say, well, good luck with that. Maybe seek out therapy or somatic therapy. You know, I know, I know a guy. Um, now I'll get to say that I'll, I'll recommend <laughs> you. Uh, but if you say there's a conversation I need to have with my girlfriend about my commitment level and I'm really confused or I'm seeing my mom next week and it always goes a certain way and I would love for it to go a different way. But no matter which way I look at it up, down, sideways, the only way I can imagine it going is the way it always goes. Well, that is what I call stuck. And that is, that is in, that is so rooted right now in the present that there's actually incentive and stakes to get unstuck now. See with issues, it, it, you know, the sort of things we go to therapy for, it takes a lot of gentle, that's not, it's not even digging. It's like erosion. You just sort of let it's it erosion. It, yeah. It's erosion, right? It's, it, it, it's, and, but with, well, it's really that uncoupling we talked about, which is that's erosion. Right. It and is the erosion. body needs the body needs time. Yes. What my work requires is that you be sick and tired of it and that you, you, you're open to getting unstuck and considering the high probability that the fact that you are stuck is a function not of the facts, but of your point of view. And if that's the case, then we take a walk together and walking seems to help loosen up the ground, you know, mm-hmm. and we have a very intentional conversation in which by definition, I have license to talk to you pretty straight and uh, <laughs> not not mess around. So it's not like my dad's trauma work where, you, you know, he sort of sits patiently and gets into deep. Uh, on the one hand, you know, as I like to say, you're traumatized, I'm traumatized, we all scream for ice cream. Uh, it's, I take it as a given. <laughs> yes. And 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 maybe the, the traumatic imprints that are manifesting in this stuck thing will come up in the conversation. And if they do, I'll say, hey, take a look. You come by this honestly. It's not original to this situation. Cool. Now let's get back to what's happening now. And the idea is, as I'm developing this, and I'd like to write a book on it, because I actually think it could be taught and done in like a peer support kind of way. Like there's no reason I'm the only person on the planet who, who should be able to do this is that when a person it's an, it's an outside in sort of healing in that it sends a message from the surface down to the deepest layers that says, Hey, you know what? It ain't necessarily. So we have a small victory here in the present, in the now, in this particular corner of my life, where I was convinced I was living as if I was completely stuck and I was having the experience of a stuck person. That's a microcosm of all of my trauma. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to get unstuck on that right now. We're going to give myself at least a choice in the matter. I might choose to continue the way I've been, but at least I'm going to have some agency, which is one of the four A's of healing that we talk about in the book. The minute that happens and I actually get choice in the matter, because I haven't had a choice up until now, if I'm stuck, I've been stuck with the best available option, which sucks. The minute I get some choice in the matter, something in me can relax and say, oh, wait a minute. Okay, that's cool. Well, what else isn't necessarily set in stone? So that's the direction in which I approach it. It's it's only somatic in the sense that the body is involved. The body is coming no, along for I, the walk. I have to back this up somatically. This is awesome. Um, so a couple years ago, I started noticing that I would have a handful. I'm no longer in private practice. I just do group stuff now. But when I when I was in private practice, I had these clients that would dissociate. Right, every session they would just zone out. They couldn't they couldn't stay with the session at all. Walking is what kept them associated because the movement of the charge that comes up when we're talking about something painful or stressful shuts you down when you're still and seated yes so walking therapy is so somatic and not done enough so when you're talking about walking loosening the ground i mean that has real somatic you know reverberations to it it's great and i love it i would love to talk to you about that sometime because oh, that's I'd be something happy to. i've been so interested in walking therapy and yeah. I, I i mean i'm calling it walking therapy i hear you, you, what is called mental chiropractic mental chiropractic because what i'm doing is or you could say mental physiotherapy in the sense mm. that we're going to have one session, one, not that you can't come back afterwards, but I want you to treat this. I want you to, mm. I want your whole system to be like, okay, today is the day. Yes. Yes. We're getting this done. It doesn't <laughs> matter. It like, I'm not the guy who's going to do it for you. I'm yeah. going to collaborate with you. I'm going to hop on board your groovy train, but your train has to be headed in the direction of 
let's get unstuck, man. Let's mm. let's let's see it differently. Okay, so we take this walk. Now both your brain hemispheres are are working, right? You're swinging your arms, you're moving your legs. Literally with every step, your point of view is changing. You're seeing different things. Even if you do a loop and come around to the beginning, the light is different. The day is different. The scene, you know, the, the surrounding cast is different. So you're having this embodied experience of what it is to not be stuck in one place. And, um, that's right. Yeah. And it is, you know, in the chiropractic metaphor, you know, indicates that I'm getting in there. I'm, I'm literally manipulating your mind. I am. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not, you know, I'm getting like manipulating the literal definition of it, which is to use the hands to move something around. I'm not using my hands, but you get what I'm saying. It's, I get what you're saying. Well, and the person's also metaphorically consenting literal. to the manipulation. Absolute you consent. Want, you're saying like, I want them ready to come that day aware of what they want to get unstuck about. I want and them not only the consent. Magic. I want them not only consenting to it. I want them demanding it. Right, right, right. So that's a whole other, I love it. It's a whole other experience. Yeah. This has been awesome to talk to you. Um, I know we'll talk again. I look forward to it. And just thank you for your time and your heart and just what you, you have such a sweetness to you. And I'm just happy how, how easily I can come through. So thank you. I was, there was a ton of ease in this conversation for me too. So thank you so much for having me. That's the end of today's episode. Now let's take a moment to notice where we feel the episode in our bodies. Close your eyes, take a breath, and let whatever wants to come up, come up. And remember, those sensations hold the wisdom that we're looking for. If you want to go deeper, visit holisticlifenavigation.com.